behind me. Here. I don't know. Um, and uh, okay, so I'm gonna do a. <laughs> don't a make yourself nervous. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, okay, I did a share. Let's see, is this gonna come up so I can see it now? Oh, if I go full screen. Okay, how are we doing here? Yep. Yeah, we still see your like notes barely on the side, but it's really not taking away from the presentation. So I'm yeah. going to say this is good. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity uh, for, for this, Jen, and in inviting uh, Bruce and I today. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is share with you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing uh, in Alaska, Greenland, and then part of Mosaic with regards to, to water vapor isotopes. Um, I thought I'd say again a little bit about the Arctic um, kind of changes and uh, the water cycle. Uh, say a few words about water isotopes as tools uh, and how we're using those today. I thought it'd be good to give a little history uh, of kind of isotope uh, systematics just to, to put this in, in, in reference and then give you and share with you some data uh, from Alaska, Greenland, and then uh, a few bits about what we're doing with Mosaic. Uh, this map continues to, to be the same more or less year after year. The, the warming's pretty extensive in the Arctic, um, but spots of cooling are, are present as well. Uh, the Arctic uh, was very different uh, a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, Franklin Expedition and many of those uh, explorers in the 1800s encountered a system uh, that was dominated by ice, and sometimes there was never such a thing as uh, an ice, a summer. Uh, today, the Arctic looks very different. Uh, we know that there's a tremendous uh, increase in the amount of open water in the Arctic. Uh, it's leading to lots of changes in the north, uh, including uh, the exchange of ocean water with the atmosphere, uh, the thermal balance of the, the planet. It's also driving changes in things like tourism uh, and shipping as well. So uh, the new Arctic uh, is upon us. Uh, as part of that, uh, both the cryosphere uh, and the hydrologic cycle are really important parts of, of the changes that we're interested in. Uh, we recognize in many parts of the north that glaciers and snow cover are changing, uh, sea ice is uh, becoming less abundant, uh, and those are also associated uh, from a cryosphere standpoint with uh, changes in permafrost. Uh, the hydrologic cycle is beginning to amplify. Uh, that's a term that was actually developed, oh, maybe 10 years ago or so. Larry Hinsman and others put together a big report about amplification of the Arctic hydrologic cycle, uh, meaning greater degrees, for instance, now of evaporation uh, and possibly changing the transport and pathways uh, of freshwater delivery across the north uh, and into the, to the lower latitudes. Uh, isotopes are a, a tool that we've been able to use uh, as a community to really understand processes with regards to the water cycle uh, in the north and, and throughout the, uh, the mid-latitudes and even into the southern ocean areas. The isotope uh, community, I, I kind of call it in the beginning. Um, many of you are familiar with this, um, but uh, it was around the time of uh, the atomic weapons uh, uh, testing uh, the colleagues begin to collect um, uh, precipitation through the IAEA network across the world. Uh, and what they found is in the upper right-hand corner here, this is the classic Dansgaard line where he was able to substitute uh, space for temperature and collected, took precipitation samples and analyzed those for, for 18.0 and compared those to, to the annual temperatures from the locations and found that uh, temperature accounts for a large amount of the variability and essentially areas that are very cold and either the high latitudes of the north or the south have these very depleted um, isotopic values uh, that those become less negative or enriched as you move into the to the mid latitudes and into the tropics and what it's allowed us to do was really uh, understand that isotopes are a fingerprint of, of climate. Um, in the lower left-hand side is a, an example of where we're plotting the two isotopes of the water molecule, uh, hydrogen uh, and oxygen, and creating what we call a, a meteoric water line. And there's some consistency in the way those two molecules uh, behave. 
and again showing that uh, values are depleted in winter and, and enriched in summer or, or less negative. It's, it's a little bit tricky, some of the wording. Um, but there's also variability around, around that uh, regression line. Um, showing that in some cases we have a lot of evaporation processes uh, and that those may represent either kind of uh, warm and moist conditions or cold and dry conditions. Um, and, and that variability is, is something that we're quite interested in because it may help us tag moisture sources. Um, these are examples of how we've evolved in the way that we've shared isotopic characteristics uh, uh, with with ourselves, uh, and this is precipitation. So much of this begun in the days of precipitation, isotope geochemistry, uh, a kind of a contour map in the upper left-hand corner. This is uh, Joel Gad and his group at IAEA in the early years showing variability in North America. Uh, we eventually moved into a much more sophisticated mapping program. Um, Bruce and Jim White and Ryan Vachon and I collaborated on producing this map of the monthly variability across our country. Um, took us 20 years to do this, um, but we've finally been able to look at, at really both the spatial and temporal variability across the entire uh, US using our, our network capabilities in collaboration with uh, NADP. And then the uh, GIS and modeling community become even more sophisticated in the lower left-hand corner and this map really reflects collaborations between uh, the US and Canada to really map out what this variability looks like across all of uh, North America. And the main points is, you know, in the upper right hand corner there, you can see alert, very depleted values, uh, moving over to Alaska, a little bit less depleted, moving into the kind of um, Canadian US border and then all the way down to the Gulf Coast. And so you see this uh, latitudinal variability um, but also when you look closely, you can see the Rocky Mountains stick out because of their, their elevation. And this is a, a figure that, that we often use to talk about why understand the modern uh, isotope uh, processes and characteristics. And really what it does is it's designed to, to give you a sense that there are lots of applications to, to what we do in this community. Um, whether it be ecology and plant water use, for instance, uh, whether it be in a big way climate proxy reconstructions. This is the ice core work that Bruce and Jim and others have, have really dedicated a lot of their lives to. Uh, it's also useful information for animal migration uh, and diet ecology, uh, but it also can be applied uh, to uh, GCM uh, predictions uh, and forecasting. And of course, uh, central to this group is atmospheric transport modeling. I wanted to share with you a quick example of some of the work we've done out of Hubbard Brook, which has been the longest precip collection site. And essentially what we were able to see with this 30 year record um, was that we see connections between the ocean, synoptic climatology and precipitation isotopes that center around the Arctic vortex. Um, and so we've got changes in climate, altering sea ice, which then is driving shifts in the polar vortex. And that's delivering uh, a lot more depleted Arctic precipitation to Hubbard Brook to Gen. Um, and this is, is in contrast to the temperature record that shows that it's warming. Um, so we would have expected the values in Hubbard Brook might have become more enriched as it's warmed in the Northeast, but in reality, they're becoming more depleted because of all these Arctic vortex events. The other example, again, getting closer to the vapor discussion here, um, is that we've been able to collect precip over many, many years at Tulik Lake. And what you see here is a temperature uh, 018 relationship for the global average, the blue line, versus what it is actually at Tulik Lake. Um, and so this gives us some estimate that, you know, individual locations are not the same everywhere. Um, and if you apply, uh, that Tulik Lake um, data to the McCall ice core in a reanalysis, uh, what you find is if you use the global average that you saw, it looks like the temperature in Tulik Lake and the North Slope of Alaska is varied by about one or two degrees. But when you apply the Tulik Lake specific data, it's more site specific, uh, you see that the variability has been about four degrees. So again, site specific analyses are, are really important little picture of Prince William Sound. Um, into the vapor. 
Uh, and so the big transition that has occurred here in part to Bruce's dedicated effort uh, years ago is that we now have an ability um, through Picaro and other companies to continuously monitor the water vapor isotopes. Uh, and we started on this process with setting up an instrument array uh, at Tulik Lake. We call him Gandalf um, because he's a wizard. He measures things you can't see. Um, and what this did was allowed us to install in one of the longest winters uh, on the North Slope, uh, this instrument array um, uh, into a, a very large uh, self-contained unit to continuously monitor water vapor isotopes um, there at Tulik Lake over the course of about five months. And our data stream uh, worked quite well. Uh, here you can just get a sense of the, the rich variability uh, in the isotope values on the left-hand side uh, is kind of winter. Uh, those values in red being 018, the values in blue being deuterium, the dots being precip events. And you can see we go from a depleted time period in winter, the values become less negative as we move into the summer. Uh, and then we start transitioning to the end on the right hand side back into fall. We also are able to really capture the difference between vapor and precip. So you can see those individual precip events corresponding with vapor and knowing that offset uh, is an important part of, of modeling. If, you, if all you have is precip, you actually can get pretty close to knowing what the vapor is. Uh, the advantage of the, of the vapor analysis, which is continuous, just like a thermometer outside your window, um, is that you can eventually uh, differentiate uh, storm tracks. And so this is a spaghetti map uh, showing storm tracks that come into Tulik Lake from the north off a dry ice covered system. Uh, those have a very distinct value isotopically and, and in a value called DXS, which is the relationship between O18 and hydrogen. Uh, they're quite different uh, as when you have moisture sources coming out of the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, those are um, uh, depleted compared to those that are enriched coming off of uh, the ice there uh, off the Beaufort. Uh, and the advantage of having these uh, continuous measurements is unusual events occur. So Gandalf was there running continuously and all of a sudden we got a massive uh, cyclone in the Arctic, totally tore up an ice covered Arctic and pushed a plume uh, of this synoptic system right by Tulik Lake and essentially Gandalf was able to smell this whiff of a complete restructuring of the ice out in the Beaufort where all of a sudden we got a big whiff of warm ocean water that evaporated into a cold atmosphere. Um, and so this continuous measurements again puts us in a place to be a sentinel in the environment. Uh, Greenland is the next uh, place that we took Gandalf uh, to begin our work up at Thule where we've been pretty active for about 20 years um, with Jen and, and Bill's um, support. Thule Air Base has been in place uh, since um, 1950s. Uh, many of you are familiar with that just watching my clock here, trying to make my 15 minutes. Uh, here's a couple of time series uh, from the work we've been doing at Thule. Uh, the top line shows you kind of um, going into winter. So you get kind of this wave formation in the, in the isotope seasonally, which shows us we're in sync with what we expect. Uh, but that DXS red line is not quite as tied to temperature because it actually represents more of the moisture sources. Um, again, Gandalf was in the right place at the right time with that big warm pulse. So during that warm pulse into the, into the north, uh, we got an immediate response with Gandalf showing us that uh, the water vapor content jumped way up, uh, the values become enriched. So again, serving as a sentinel in the environment. Uh, with some back analysis, uh, this was actually the result of a kind of atmospheric river event that occurred up along the west coast of, of Greenland. So we see this pulse of warm air coming up. Again, a, a change in, in kind of moisture source in the short term, we're able to, to see that. Um, by monitoring processes at Thule, um, day in and day out for months and years on end, we begin to create what we like a wind rose, we call this an isotope rose. And what you can see is in the upper left-hand corner, the very depleted values are coming off the out of the out of the southeast, um, kind of a ca across the Greenland ice sheet into Thule. Uh, if you go all the way to summer here, you see that that completely turns around and we get a, a sea breeze uh, coming off of Baffin Bay. 
The other characteristic about the atmosphere in the north is focused a lot on the North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, and we've been interested to see whether or not we can detect daily changes in the NAO as opposed to historical work that's focused more on monthly and yearly changes in the NAO. Uh, there was a nice paper that gave an example uh, that showed us, for instance, that when we have negative NAOs, we have a tremendous amount of, of coastal glacier loss. Um, but in the northwest uh, part of Greenland, we have a lot of gain of, of ice and snow in that area. Um, and that, that that flips with the NAO. So we've got this kind of long-term change with the NAO on back and forth on both sides of the island. Um, during our measurement period, uh, we've gone from a, from a negative NAO into a positive NAO. And so again, asking whether or not we can see that with these high frequency measurements. Uh, this is a circum um, uh, polar map here looking from the North Pole down. Greenland's kind of scratched out in yellow. I'm sorry about the scribbly lines, but the point is is that in the negative phase of the NAO in late November, we can see some real specific moisture tracks. So moisture coming in through the Bering Sea, coming up the west coast of Greenland and ex exiting out of the Fram Strait. Um, when we go into the positive phase, all of a sudden the whole configuration of the north is flipped. Uh, moisture exiting the Bering, uh, exiting down along the, um, uh, the east coast of Greenland, going north uh, on the uh, east side of Svalbard and dropping into um, parts of northern Canada. So our work here, give me another minute and a half, um, our work here has really shown that in Greenland that we have air temperature and humidity as important controls. We see moisture sources are important controls. And then I haven't shown you, but we're also seeing some real capacity to, um, to actually capture sublimation and evaporation. Um, and so this is an important part, for instance, during these big melt events on Greenland. And we gave a presentation at AGU about that. Uh, Mosaic, as you know, is a very active program. Uh, we've actually uh, have a project funded. Frank and Jen have been helping us with this. Uh, setting up a, a monitoring as part of the atmospheric program. Uh, what we've done is we've established uh, collaboratively these water vapor isotope monitoring stations at Barrow and Tulik with NEON, um, Thule, Nord, and East Grip in the summer only uh, with NSF. Uh, we've got Norwegian, uh, Finland support for Apollo uh, that is at uh, uh, the Zeppelin Observatory, Arctic Finland we have a site and in Northern Sweden, we have a site, and then a collection of precip sites as well. Uh, and in the right-hand side, what you can see is the kind of example where we are er using these transport models that allow us to look at connections uh, between these sites during events. Here's a, a data stream that's showing you that simultaneously we have measurements from Polis, that's Arctic Finland, Thule, Polar Stern data, that's gonna get filled in here in the next round that Martin sends us the continuous data from Barrow and Tulik. And, and these are all leading uh, to this kind of final figure where you can begin to see, and, and what we're learning about are these connections between the transport processes across our network. Um, and this is a very dynamic system, almost changing daily, uh, but this high frequency measurements are allowing us to, to understand that process. So last slide, um, Continuous real-time high-frequency measurements uh, are teaching us about the processes and mechanisms governing water vapor isotopes. Um, and a network of stations on land and in the Arctic Ocean provides a, a, comp a completely new perspective on atmospheric transport. With that, thank you. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes over. Oh, no worries. I think we'll be okay. Um, does, do, do we want to, does anybody have one or two questions maybe for Jeff before we go to Bruce and then we'll, um, we can do a lot more questions after that as well. Should I get out of my stop share? Probably, unless somebody has a specific question about one of your figures, but see if we have any discussion here. Hi, this is Irina Petropolsky. I have a question about this observations. Are these, um, how, how long, I, I, did, I missed how long they've been taken. Um, is this so, recent? Um, our, our, uh, our observations at, at Thule have been uh, over two years now. Um, so we have, uh, we've been very fortunate that we had sampling and analysis before Mosaic, for instance. So we almost have a year before Mosaic started. So now we have this kind of completed network during Mosaic. 
Um, our work in Arctic Finland has also been over about two years. Um, Barrow and Tulik have been about a year and a half or two uh, running uh, as well. And some of the other sites, um, for instance, Nord, where Hercules is, that's a newer site. Apollo got started in December. Um, so yeah, there's some variability between the sites, but right now it's very comp we're fortunate to be pretty comprehensive. All of the sites operating uh, since uh, Mosaic kicked off in the fall. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and go to Bruce. All right. Okay, can everybody see that all right? Yes, it looks good. Okay, I'm getting pop-up messages from my screen that my internet connection is intermittent, so uh, if I have to change rooms in the middle of this, uh, bear with me, but. And you can always uh, stop your video camera too. Sometimes that helps with bandwidth. Okay, great, thanks. Um, you're talking. So today I wanna to tell you about some of the atmospheric measurements we're making in um, Green Northeast Greenland. And uh, I just want to acknowledge all my co-collaborators here, um, most of which are from INSTAR and several of which are from the University of uh, Bergen in Norway and also our funding. Uh, this is what I'm going to show you today has been funded by an eager grant through Jen Mercer and um, it's in conjunction with our field site in Northeast Greenland. For those of you who are not familiar with eScript, um, this is a site in Northeast Greenland that was established uh, four or five years ago. Uh, for the primary purposes of, of drilling a deep ice core in an active moving, a uh, fast moving ice stream, largely motivated by ice dynamics. But of course, uh, there's a paleoclimate component and our lab is working to measure the stable isotopes of the ice core from the e script site. Um, this is an international site. It's uh, about 12 different countries with uh, dozens of scientists working on another number of ancillary projects associated with surface science programs, uh, radar, and uh, a host of other projects that are sort of uh, in support of the eScript ice core. Here you can see the, the, the geodesic dome that's actually sitting on skis that was towed from the site in northwest Greenland, about 400 kilometers away, uh, to establish our base camp. And then it's supported seasonally with the addition of weather ports there. You can see a person off to the left walking from that pile of snow. That's actually a tunnel that goes down into the, the underground works where the science trench and the drill trench are located. Um, uh, it's been operating for the last few summers. Um, as you might guess, we're taking a break from 2020 due to the COVID-19 and we'll resume our operations in 2021. So our primary goal there, as I mentioned, is the ice core. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but it is worth mentioning because it is part of our motivation. Um, we're using a continuous flow method to develop our ice core record in situ on site or have been. And um, this method allows us, uh, unlike previous methods of the last few decades where we cut up small samples and measure discrete samples, we're melting the entire uh, sticks of ice and developing uh, about 2,400 data points per meter, which has opened up a whole cottage industry of uh, spectral analysis into paleoclimate events. Um, you can see the, the Neem drill on the left and the crews working in the science trench there. So um, thank you, Jeff, for a great introduction to sort of stable isotopes, but I can't give a talk on stable isotopes without giving a tip of the hat to our late, great uh, Willie Dansgaard, uh, upon whose shoulders this science stands. Um, that plot is very famous. Jeff had the same plot there uh, showing the temperature dependence of isotopes. Um, this is why, for those few of you who may not know, this is why uh, paleo uh, temperature proxies and ice cores works. Um, so this has been a robust relationship around for many years, giving us great insights into climate dynamics from the past and ice cores. Uh, but we're also learning um, to look at water vapor and how it uh, makes its way into the ice core. So there's this assumption that there's an a, a transfer function of climate from the atmosphere to the ice core, to the ice sheet, and stored in the ice core. It's true, but as we measure the surface processes, we're aware of a lot of excursions that 
are part of the post-depositional process. This is some data from my colleague Hans Christian, Steen Larsen, who at his tower measured uh, humidity, uh, temperature, and isotopes on a Picaro real time over many seasons. And here's a stack profile from just a week, um, 10 days in uh, Julian Day 180. And you can see a diurnal uh, pattern in temperature and humidity, but also in stable isotopes. And um, this is uh, quite interesting to us because all of us who dug snow pits are very aware that there's a very chaotic signal in the snowpack, which eventually uh, is diffused down into a very discernible signal, uh, seasonal signal in the ice core. But this was some work that HC did, and I'll walk you through this. There's a lot going on this slide. This shows um, the blue line is 018 uh, of the water vapor collected to the tower. The red line represents little snow samples from the top half centimeter of snow. The gray areas are precipitation events, and the, the white boxes are clear sky between precipitation events. And what you'll notice is the red line kind of follows the blue line in between precipitation events. So this is our two-way conversation that the ice sheet is talking to the atmosphere and it's uh, relating. So I don't think Willie's gonna turn over in his grave, um, but ice cores are, and ice copes, ice isotopes and ice cores are governed not only by the precipitation isotopes, but also what's going on on the surface. So it kind of is a challenge to our assumption of over 50 years, but we want to know how important is this to the paleoclimate record. So this is just one of the motivations for taking a closer look at water vapor isotopes, um, but we're also interested in how that might relate to sublimation and vapor flux. So here's a plot that's uh, from Boivert uh, 2016 that shows vapor flux at different elevations modeled on the Greenland ice sheet. And you can see there's some variation here, but in some cases, we have up to um, 0.4 kilograms uh, per meter squared per day uh, coming off the ice sheet. And I should point out that uh, models make estimates anywhere from 6 to 18% of the mass, mass loss from this process. So yes, it's a term in the mass balance equation for the Greenland ice sheet, calving, meltwater. Uh, it may not be a big term, but it's a significant portion. And uh, I should point out that while uh, Jan Lennertz and uh, came up with like 12%, uh, Connie Stefan and um, Justin Box in measurements in 2001 estimated it even as high as 18%. So clearly some more work on this is needed to be done. And if we weren't convinced enough that this was important and worth doing, uh, the GRACE satellite observations uh, kind of nailed this, showing us the mass loss over time. I would draw your attentions to the uh, the 2012, that was a melt year that showed up in MODIS and uh, a number of other proxies for what was going on. That was a very big melt year. So we have launched a sort of uh, all points uh, process here to look at uh, all these processes. This is a little cartoon on the left showing our camp with an ice core and the, the tower sampling and our attempts to get at sublimation and condensation by making measurements above the tower. Um, if we had unlimited funds and bold um, twin otter pilots, we could probably probe this uh, planetary boundary layer or between the troposphere and the near atmosphere of the ice sheet with uh, aircraft. That's expensive and dangerous. And the obvious solution to us was to kind of pioneer a pathway where we might measure this interface with drones, uh, including a multi-rotor in 2018 and a fixed wing that we pioneered in uh, 2019. And in the, in the right slide there, you can see the location of the East Grip Camp uh, from a digital elevation model um, that shows actually its location at the top of that moving ice stream. So for those of you who make measurements of isotopes, it, you might uh, understand that it's not a, a given or an obvious that you might be able to collect a sample in a flask uh, and then later analyze its water vapor for isotopes. Water is a very sticky molecule. Um, we had to take some important things into consideration when designing a platform to do this. Uh, glass turned out to be the only substance to really do this with any sort of authenticity. Uh, but we pioneered that using this off-the-shelf DJI um, multi-rotor drone with a little uh, six flask package so we could take a loft. And here you can see um, there's a scattered temperature plot there due in part to a low, um, low cost temperature probe and some hysteresis in the sensor 
but it gets a, you get an idea for the temperature profile there. And we were able to collect flasks in pairs at these different altitudes and um, measuring them later on the surface within minutes to within an hour or two, we found that we could get reproducibility between the flasks here shown at 68 meters and 131 meters. They agree with basically within the reproducibility of the Picaro instrument itself. This was kind of a jaw dropping, astonishing um, realization to us that we could actually make measurements with this kind of precision. So um, it gave us some hope. And uh, I should point out that one of the um, uh, shortcomings of the season was we discovered that running um, off the shelf multi-rotors at 75 North had real problems with magnetic interference and flight control leading to erratic flight behavior, uncontrollable yaw, and it would pick a direction and go. And uh, it gave me all this gray hair. Um, fortunately, no one was hurt. We got samples, we proved the concept, and we decided the next year to come back with a fixed wing platform. Here you can see, um, this is a 10 foot wide wind spang. This is a, a, a fixed wing that's made by a group in Boulder called Black Swift Technologies. We chose it because it has this modular capability. So the payload there is, um, a, can handle a two and a half kilogram payload. So if you can come up with something that fits into the form factor of that nose cone, and is two and a half kilograms, it can fly. And uh, this group is an offshoot of the CU uh, Aerospace Engineering Group. And uh, they worked with us to allow us to make our own nose cone. Um, here I'm showing you the latest evolution, but this is how we took our six flasks and put them in that form factor. Uh, they're 500 cc flasks. Um, they're controlled with a Arduino based uh, or feather based control that actually goes through the aircraft communication systems. Um, we learned that our temperature and relative humidity measurements were not nearly uh, as good as they could or should be. So we borrowed a page out of the Radioson group and gone with a Vesela uh, temperature relative humidity probe. Um, getting a fast responsive um, probe is really critical in these cold Arctic environments where we're operating at minus 25, minus 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, you really need something that's gonna respond quickly because we're moving at a minimum of 12 meters a second. Um, but the nice thing is we could print much of this in our own lab on a 3D printer and um, construct this uh, right, right at home. Um, so moving forward, this is what it looks like in the field. This is a launch you're seeing off a pneumatic rail. This is very similar to what you might uh, see being launched off an aircraft carrier. A large volume of compressed air is released instantaneously in a system that launches the aircraft. It's con completely controlled with a tablet. You don't have to be a pilot. I'm not a pilot. I have no interest in being trained with one. Um, it, it's now on its way to a controlled pre-programmed orbit. And then we can specify ascent and descent and landing. It's equipped with a radar altimeter. So when it gets close to the ground, the laser altimeter um, senses the ground, cuts the engine and flares and lands. So what do we get from it? Um, we take our measurements very carefully on the uh, ascent going up. We're looking at uh, humidity and temperature, which we quickly uh, translate into potential temperature and specific humidity along with pressure to get the altitude. It's really important that we get this data real time because the boundary layer may be at different altitude or not there at all. And so we want to inform our sampling altitudes. Um, since these cannot always be easily picked out with the eye, we have this data going in real time to an algorithm that looks at um, variance and um, calculates the highest probability of where the boundary layer might be, allowing us to choose the altitudes at which we might wanna take samples. So here's a plot of a handful of flights from last year. You can see the boundary layer in some cases is quite distinct and others not so much. Um, the gray line is what we, I will show you today, which has the most distinct uh, boundary layer condition here, about 250 meters altitude. Um, I should point out we're flying at about, uh, the ground surface level is about 2,700 meters at, um, in, at the East Grip site and we're, going uh, up to 500 meters above ground level. We have clearance from the Danish equivalent of the FAA to fly to 15,000 feet in a restricted flight zone that is ours. We just uh, are in close contact with, uh, with them regarding our flights. So here's what we get. Um, we have here in black is a specific humidity um, line and the red dots represent where we sampled above and below the green dotted line, which was the uh, best guess for the boundary layer based on the algorithm with the uh, blue purple lines as the uncertainty on that. 
Uh, and you can see the surface samples, which are right on top of each other, were uh, in exact agreement, and you get a little more spread up here in time and space. But basically, we're seeing a 20 per mil jump across this interface. So we get a really um, radical picture of uh, vapor transport through the lower atmosphere. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I will tell you that making these water vapor measurements on the surface is uh, accuracy and precision are super important. On the right, you can see where samples from the flasks are once on the ground are fed into the cavity ring down, uh, Picaro. And on the left part of it is our method to introduce uh, isotopic standards through a nebulizer, creating a um, sort of sonic velocity spray into a tube furnace that allows us to calibrate the isotopes. But it's also important that we really um, are able to characterize the instrument's uh, concentration dependence so we can really reduce the amount of water vapor going into the instrument and uh, characterize the curve. So um, it's important to have uh, sort of a lab on the field along with this project. So all of the data we're producing is going to be um, uh, communicate used by our team of modeling people. Um, here's a, the MAR model simulation outputs for eScript in June of 19 over uh, the week uh, in June. You can see in the upper plot is temperature and the lower plot is specific humidity. And you can see in the upper plot the incursion of colder, drier air coming in up here through, and um, talking about mixing and our hope is that our measurements can provide some validation and some calibration for models like this that are uh, reanalysis products that um, can improve their quality. So here's, here's an example of the lower atmospheric structure over Summit and eScript from the model outputs, looking at uh, summers and winters, summer in the upper plot, looking at water vapor and temperature in the lower plot. And there, you can see there's quite a difference and the altitude for the boundary layer does change. But the take home message here is that the e-script measurements can add important understanding of model representations in the, in the lower boundary. Um, the, off to your right side is the level at which the model has uh, points, data points. Um, and you can sort of see our height there, um, how high we can go, about 500 meters. So, I'll give you one example of some of the profiles um, looking with the drone measurements compared with the MAR model, and then also the, the prom ice uh, the weather station located near East Grip. And you can see there's a fairly constant offset between the weather station temperature and the um, rather simple temperature measurement that was being used that year. Um, so the accuracy may be an issue there for a degree or so, but in general, the model is not seeing exactly what the profiles we are seeing. Um, sometimes it gets the right shape, sometimes it's close, but we, there's room for a lot of improvement here. And we need more investigations, clearly, and we hope to be back in 2021. So our future plans for this, uh, we want to return to Greenland and maximize the sampling density in space and time. And uh, in the postseason, we'll um, couple this with rigorous model comparisons and we also want to develop this potential for sampling other gases. We see this as sort of a, uh, a pioneering effort that has more applications than what we're just doing. So for example, um, we have a proposal that's been submitted under the NNA to look at methane in the Arctic, and we're partnering, potentially funded, to work with a local group that is uh, working on a mid-IR instrument that's portable that could be deployed in the nose cone of our aircraft. So that's just one example that could be done um, you could also use the same flask sampling method for looking at other trace gases, uh, isotopes, things you, you can't measure on the fly, but you could measure later with the flask uh, capturing ability. Um, one of the uh, applications we think about is looking at uh, maybe launching radiation sensors that might help capture the attenuation of incoming radiation uh, versus altitude that could improve our models there. So. Um, it's been a very useful platform. We're very happy with the way it's working out, and we hope it'll uh, continue to provide a rich data set that'll increase our understanding in water vapor. So that's all I have. Thanks, Bruce. That was great. Um, questions for Bruce? Was it that clear? It was very yeah, clear. Good. It's good. Any Questions for Bruce or Jeff, uh, or discussion points from anyone. 
Barry, what did you think about all that? I, I thought it was really exciting that um, this this new technology. I've I've seen the Swift used for other applications, and I've I've been to Thule and Summit. It was great to learn about the activities at East Grip. I I, um, I know how hard it is to work in in this environment, and I've done a lot of work with balloons and radiosons and tethered balloons trying to measure the PBL height in these challenging <laughs> environments. So um, I, I'm impressed and I'm interested in um, some of the other gases you might be able to measure. I, I'm familiar with the Quanta 3 um, instrument, but uh, you know th that's sort of the futures, these sort of low power, low weight, lower cost sensors. So um, lots of exciting developments going on. And it's great to see some NASA data with the GRACE follow on data is, um, you know, it's such a dynamic environment you, you all are working in with the record melt going on there. Um, so what about one of the things that, and Bruce probably has been thinking the same thing is one of the things that we did actually as part of an earlier one, we put one of these on a, on a 182 uh, aircraft up at Tulik. So when we first had Gandalf running, we haven't published this data, but but we had a 182 kind of flying above our tower during the same time that the continuous measurements were made. And then we had the 182 headed uh, to the west uh, out toward Ivatuk and then a little bit to the to the east toward Imnaviat. And you know, one of the things, again, you know, seeing that, uh, what is it, the NASA P3 that does all the ice bridge stuff, right? So mm -hmm. I love it when that's parked in the Thule hangar because it looks like a model airplane <laughs> compared to what a B-52 would do into that thing. But, you know, one of the things I wonder about is expanding uh, the capacity uh, of ice bridge, for instance, to include some of these water vapor isotope measurements um, you know, at a, at a larger scale, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your yeah. thoughts. So on there's, that. so unfortunately Icebridge is uh, phasing out. It's now that we had the overlap between um, ISAT2 and Icebridge. Um, but there, there's, there was always plenty of room on the P3 for more instruments. They kept putting more instruments on there, but we are, um, we have done um, P3 and DC-8 flights over Greenland. Um, there, the, um, the water isotopes are a really important tracer. Um, I, I, would, I would talk to the new cryosphere program scientists at NASA headquarters, Thor Thorsten Marcus, and uh, about um, his office is just down the hall from mine. Uh, and we, you know, there's, there's definitely um, opportunity to think about what, what um, observations, what value you could get um, contribute, you know, this integrated observing system where you have satellites getting the big picture and you have the ground sites on the ground getting you the really high resolution um, data from a few sites, and then the aircraft's giving you a chance to integrate those two um, observing, give, give you this sort of mid-range um, observing strategy. Well, you can go down the hall and tell them about this great talk you heard today. <laughs> I will. Or you can I'll send, send them, them an email, not go down the hall. but Yeah, them I'll send them the hall. link when it comes <laughs> out. But uh, yeah, he's, he's only been here a few months, so uh, I haven't dragged him into the Arctic just yet, but uh, it's well, a again, good this is, to talk this to is him. the place where you could really see NSF and NASA collaborating. I mean, yeah. that's part of this whole discussion. Why we're here right now is, you know, it's not just NASA, it's not just an NSF group, it's both and, and others. And so I think that, and maybe some of this applies to the above program too, I think. Yeah. Um, some of his so you've hit the nail on the head. That's the purpose of IARCPIC is to get the, yeah. the different U.S. federal agencies to work together, so. Yeah, I'd be interested in those discussions too, Barry. I think uh, I think Thorsten's a good addition and we should maybe try to pull him in. Sure. Some of these things. I do have a quick question for Bruce, if that's okay. I, I have Bruce? to run to another okay. conference, but uh, thanks again, everybody. Yeah. Much appreciated. Thank you. I'll ask one quick question and then I know everybody's running out of time. 
So you showed um, of your flights, you had one that had a really clear boundary layer at East Grip and then several that didn't. Was that, did that surprise you? And, and then did you see large differences in your class sample measurements um, on the flights that didn't have a, a distinguished boundary layer, anything at all based on altitude or was it pretty well mixed? Yeah, well, based based on this is our real first adventure into this. Everything was a surprise. So um, maybe from an atmospheric standpoint, it wasn't surprising. The boundary layer is not. Oh, we lost him. Yeah, maybe he'll come back. Sometimes mine goes out. <laughs> oh, he's back. OK, I'm back. So you're back. We lost you for a second. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, everything was a surprise because we were first doing it. Um, Oh, I lost you again, maybe. The, um, nope, we're still um, there. Okay. Um, yeah, the boundary layer would come and go, and, and um, the fact that it would be at different altitudes is maybe not surprising, but I think on those days where we didn't see a clear boundary, there was more homogeneity of the samples through it, uh, as you'd expect. But um, this year, when we go back, or sorry, the next year, yeah. We hope to um, have a lot more real-time uh, measurements from models and from uh, forecasting that allow us to really look at weather patterns moving through and see how those develop and looking at more at um, intrusions of air masses from higher altitudes and uh, to harvest some of the salometer data. Um, so we hope to be just taking a lot more data and a lot more intelligently. Um, but yeah, the other thing I didn't mention in my talk was that um, for any other process that doesn't lend itself to having an in-situ measurement aloft, um, one of the problems you face in an aircraft that moves this quickly is getting a measurement density. So you have to have really like a, a five or 10 hertz instrument to really make sense of it. Or um, we have uh, thought about taking technology that was pioneered by Peter Tons, you may be familiar with the Air Corps, where you basically have a tube in its original form was sent aloft in a balloon and it was sort of closed on one end, opened on the other and evacuated just by the mere fact of gaining altitude. And then when being released from the balloon and flowing back to the ground, it would fill up. You close the valve, bring it home, hook it up to an instrument, last in, first out, and you get this sort of organized core of the atmosphere. Well, that same concept can be applied horizontally. If you have a critical uh, flow constriction and a pump, you can actually core the air and couple that with your GPS location to measure whatever you want. And in that, you can, you can sample quickly and measure slowly. And so you can uh, use instruments that need more time in the cavity that way and sort of basically virtually slow your aircraft down. So those are some of the things we're thinking about. Cool. Okay, well, we're five minutes past the hour. So unfortunately, I think we're going to have to stop our call. Um, if people have additional questions or discussion, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to our speakers. Um, and I want to thank both Jeff and Bruce for being with us today and giving these great talks. So um, I'll save my questions for conversations that we have, as I'm sure I'll be talking to both of you soon. <laughs> um, right. and, uh, but I definitely encourage people to, to reach out uh, and, uh, and continue the conversation if you weren't able to ask your questions today. So thank you, both of you, for especially yeah. for- Pleasure. Uh, Thanks for organizing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks, Jen, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Anything else, Meredith, or should we sign off? I'm just putting in the chat box there, the link to the meeting. Um, that's where the, uh, the recording will be posted. We're running a little bit behind on that right now, but it will be posted there. There's also comment section at the bottom. So if you want to ask questions or continue discussion there, it's a good place to do it. So if we recorded our own, where do we find that? <laughs> <laughs> Bruce said, hit record. I hit it. I didn't know where it went. <laughs> it will become obvious once you close Zoom, I think. Okay. I've done this once before. Okay. Call Bruce. <laughs> yeah, call, call me. Call me. Call me. <laughs> okay, you guys. Thank right. you, everyone. Yeah. Stay right. healthy. Take care. See you next time. Bye. You too. Bye now. <laughs> Bye.